Welcome to Skill Me Up Expert Talk, Introduction to Azure DevOps. I hope everyone is well today. We're going to take a look at Azure DevOps from an introductory point of view. Now, my name is uh, Michael Oliver, and I'm a Senior Cloud Solutions Architect with Skill Me Up. You can reach me on the Skill Me Up community page or on any of the platforms here. And today, we're going to cover Agile uh, and Scrum background in terms of Azure DevOps. We're going to cover Azure boards, repo, pipelines, test plans, and artifacts, and then follow up with a wrap up. First, we'll take up uh, basically a background on Agile, Scrum, and Azure DevOps. One of the things to consider is Azure DevOps is process aware. It's providing a team collaboration using established processes and best practices. We're doing this to provide an organizational level planning and it works best when contributing teams are all in. We use Azure DevOps to effectively track and advance the project timeline and we can consider it as a accurate to-do list. What do we need to accomplish and deliver this product? What do we need to provide organizational level planning to a process that we use to deliver using a proven workflow for completion? It's also an opportunity for teams to collaborate quickly to assign to-do items to open resources based on role and officially complete items to advance the project completion over time. In today's engineering environment, all of this boils down to accepting a process, using a process-aware tool that tracks to-do items based on that process, and Azure DevOps is that tool. Note that there are three common process templates that are used in Azure DevOps. Agile process template, the Scrum process template, and the CMMI process template. Each of these process templates are fully functional and designed within the methodology that they support as top of mind. And note that the Template is applied to the project at creation time. Once applied, the process runs and can be customized to a high degree to fit individual organizational or team requirements. The caution here is customization is a double-edged sword. Too much customization can inject friction into the system. So if you're new to any of the processes here, or if you're new to Azure DevOps, keep your customization to a minimum in order to ensure team success you're getting to know the tool and the process. Once you have proficiency in organizational success, then you can look at customization as a way to, to uh, gain efficiencies over nominal baselines. So one of the first uh, templates we can take a look at really quickly are is the Azure DevOps Agile, uh, Agile uh, template. So what's happening here is you're going to create a project in Azure DevOps. Uh, during that creation process, Azure DevOps is going to ask you to select one or more templates. And essentially, uh, those of you who are familiar with Agile and Scrum, you'll notice the epic feature user story task relationship. Um, Agile has an additional uh, entity called issue that allows you to track issues against uh, the project during the project timeline. Scrum is very similar. Rather than issue, they use the term impediment to kind of map to the, the Scrum, uh, the scrum uh, methodology. But for the most part, the two uh, templates, both uh, Agile and Scrum, are very similar. The CMMI template is typically a template that you're going to use in Azure projects, Azure DevOps projects, if, you're, if you have uh, change management and risk management applied. And this is going to be a more developed uh, process. So typically, teams, when they're new to Azure DevOps, will start with the Agile or the Scrum template uh, because that maps so well to lightweight uh, team interaction. But it's important to know that the CMMI template is here because CMMI and ITIL processes are commonly used in larger, more developed teams. So as your team grows, as uh, 
issue a change in risk management requirements and tracking grows, this may be a template that you can uh, evolve to. So just in covering, in Azure DevOps, we have project-oriented relationships. The projects are driven uh, using workflow within templates. So one thing to consider is that everything in Azure DevOps within these projects are covered as, are uh, tracked as work items. So work items are unique and searchable items of work. They're unique units of structured data reflecting key points of information about the team and the project and the project status. So most of the interactions that you're going to have with Azure DevOps in terms of the, the process for your project are going to be related to work items, whether they're stories, tasks, epics, features, bugs, every single one of those things is a form of work item. So to recap, we zoom the lens into microscopic mode. The work item is the, the specific level of granularity that projects operate on. This work item is a discrete unit of structured data. Uh, it represents a unique and durable item of work tied to measures and schedule within the process. At first, that sounds a bit complicated, but in practice, it's not. Think of work item literally as a item of work. So with that, for those of you who are familiar with other well-known project tracking tools, work items are similar to Jira or GitHub. Um, DevOps offers different work items to track different types of information. And this is based on the project that you choose during creation. So let's zoom the lens way out now and understand that projects that are using these methodology templates exist within an SDLC or a software development lifecycle. And so this is the way Microsoft, uh, the creators of Azure DevOps, see the SDLC. It's this, this infinity uh, shape here where we're basically planning, coding, building, testing, release, deploy, operate, and monitor. And this thing continues on throughout the life cycle of a product. And here you can see that Microsoft have, have positioned the key pieces of Azure DevOps in certain areas here to sort of illustrate where these things might play within the organization. As you trace along the continuum, we can see that the SDLC execution is an iterative process. So we're repeating a predictable and consistent uh, process. Each output is an input to the next stage until your job is done. And then in the next iteration, we're gonna start all over to build the next product or the next release of an existing product that will compete in the marketplace. So with that, let's consider what it takes to, to move from, let's say, a Scrum or Agile template to a project reality. We'd sign up for Azure DevOps subscription. One project, I think one to five projects is free and there are paid enterprise levels um, that offer additional enterprise functionality. But for the most part, on the freemium side, you're going to get pretty much everything that you can possibly do with Azure DevOps at a smaller scale. We're gonna create a project using one of the common templates um, projects can be one or many projects, can be big or small, distributed enterprise teams, or just a few fellow hackers. Then we're gonna invite team members to those projects, either through integrating with Active Directory tenant directly or through email invites as guests. Um, so once we have all that set up, now what? Let's take a tour through Azure DevOps using main navigation. Along the way, we're going to stop at major points of interest to highlight the key features that Azure DevOps brings to the table. So the first thing to notice, on creation of a project, projects can be either public or private. In the case of public uh, projects, what happens is the project is created, Azure DevOps provides a forward-facing URL, and the, the project becomes uh, anonymous. Doesn't require users to log in, so it's more like uh, what you might see on a, Git, a GitHub repo that's public. In this case of the private 
project. Uh, this is something that more enterprise teams would use, and this is also the default. It, you have an administrator that controls access by inviting users to contribute. In either case, DevOps manages the access and provides the URL for web navigation and API integration. And it's at this point, I'll note that Azure DevOps, once a project is created, also provides a unique uh, URL for API integration. So you can programmatically drive the, the process within the project uh, using API integration means. So main navigation is really simple. It's essentially these hubs. So the board, repos, pipelines, artifacts, and test plans on the main navigation. Once you create a project, whether it's public or private, administrators can use the main navigation customization to enable or disable one or more of these to, to right size the capabilities of uh, Azure DevOps to the team. One of the things to consider is that Azure DevOps, as is tracking work items related to the project and the project process behind it, uses area paths to segment work items. So you can create individual area paths for uh, that correspond to individual features within, let's say, a larger development process. Um, so for instance, if you had a web integration and a shipping integration, you might have two area paths to represent the web purchase path or workflow and a shipping purchase path or workflow. As well, queries drive the content accessibility throughout the entire system. So everything that you see at, that has to do with work items within the workflow of Azure DevOps has an underlying query that's driven that drives the, um, the result. So let's take a look at Azure Boards, which is the first major hub of Azure DevOps. Azure DevOps is a visual interactive space for easier like understanding and visualization of product status. It provides easy tracking of work items within the process and allows for quick work item creation and a quick way to determine potential bottlenecks using your uh, selected process, whether it's Scrum or more of a Kanban interpretation. You can quickly add and manage and track user stories, backlog items, issues, tasks, features, and bugs associated with your product, uh, with your project directly through the UI of the boards. Let's take a look real quick at some of the um, the boards here. One sec here. I'm going to switch screens here real quick to an instance of Azure DevOps. And here you can see the overview hub, boards, repos, pipelines, test, um, test plans, artifacts. We jump over to boards here. Here you can see a flat list of work items. These are those granular to-do items for your giant to-do list. Classic example is this really simple task work item that was created. You can see that there are certain uh, bits of information that are um, tracked based on the type of process that you chose. So in the case of this particular project, the Agile uh, uh, process was chosen. And so there are some pre-built fields here. Um, looking back on this, realize that every single one of these views is a query. So this is a query that 
query is all of the work items that are available for this project. Shifting to boards, what you see is a visual representation of a Scrum, Agile, or Kanban board. And you can see that very quickly, there's a lot of information that is suddenly surfaced to the user uh, along the, the, the process pipeline. So we're going from new, newly defined work item to uh, work items that, that follow a particular status throughout the process until they're done. So looking at one of these items, this is a more complex item that is actually created from the um, uh, Parts Unlimited uh, Microsoft test uh, project, which uh, we can cover that later. But there's actually a tool out there that will create a whole test project um, as if it was running, as if there was actually a team running on it. And so that allows us to kind of take a look at all the capabilities that are available. So if we click in on this story here, a couple of things I want to point out. One, this is a work item that's a product backlog item. So we're using the Scrum template. The area path shows the possibilities for uh, features that are, that are uh, segmented by area path. So for instance, inside here, there's a global shipping team, a global shipping test team, and two development teams. One is uh, database uh, focused and one is just a development team. So each one of these area paths can uh, segment out all of the work items to make sure that teams can stay focused on particular features and areas. This particular story, uh, this particular work item is a backlog item or what we consider a Agile or Scrum story, and it's in a new state. It has been assigned to myself as a user, and currently there are zero comments. So if teams add a comment and then save off, sorry, here, running a little slow here, save off this comment, we'll start to see that all of this information is updated in real time. Other things to note is that for the particular development process, we've chosen to add links to development and what this is is actually a code repo that exists in Azure DevOps. So this story is actually associated with this code repo. So if we click in on this, you can see that really fast you can navigate directly to the code repository that represents the code line for this application. And that's very key. This allows teams to jump back and forth across the entire fabric of the project that's being tracked and allows us to drill down into specific things. And you can also see that for uh, people who are familiar with Git, we can actually run up a pull request right here uh, as a result of this story. And typically if you're following um, agile sort of best practices, there'll be a description and then a done when acceptance criteria here. So you can see how Azure DevOps is using work items to map to existing processes that are widely held within development teams uh, around the world. A couple other things to point out is that this story rolls up to a feature. Um, and if I click on that as a parent, we can see here that we have a feature, which is also a work item. And you can see that it has a unique identifier it's a different type of work item. It's a feature work item, which has a parent that rolls up to an additional work item, which is Epic. So here you can see that there is a whole hierarchy of work items that can be created to allow teams to effectively manage the to-do list that is their project. So underneath the boards is a backlog, and the backlog is just, uh, in the traditional Agile Scrum sense, it is literally the list of all the things that the team has 
suggested that they're going to do. And backlogs are interesting because um, we shift from the board here. You have this story. You go to backlogs, the set of all things that are in that to-do list. You can use customization, query customization, to uh, show the backlog in a hierarchical format. So when I was showing you this work item and I went to this feature and I went to this epic, you can see that there's this relationship. So teams can use Azure DevOps uh, boards to set up uh, these relationships. In addition, the Boards Hub supports an advanced query system that allows us to create or to use existing queries that are sort of boilerplate uh, queries, queries that we expect um, that we're going to share across teams. So critical bugs, unfinished work, user stories. You can also create queries uh, specifically for you as a user. So I've created a couple of these custom queries. Uh, one of the queries has uh, global shipping work items, which is a sub project within uh, Azure Boards. And this query shows me this hierarchical view of all of the work items the epics, the features, the stories, tasks, and test cases for this particular project. So that's an overview of Azure Boards. Let's take a look at Azure Repos. Azure Repo provides an integrated set of version control tools that allows to manage our code lines. Uh, there's a native uh, code format called TVCS. Uh, this is something that is really only used by uh, Microsoft. Um, it's kind of a, a reverse compatible version of uh, TFS, if, you, if a few of you remember TFS. But more commonly, pretty much everybody around the world, at least from a global aspect, is using Get for obvious reasons. So typically when you create projects and, and you create repos within Azure DevOps and associate those with the project tracking, either in Agile Scrum or CMMI, you're gonna be using uh, Get as the, the source control provider. So what we get with repos is a centrally located place that allows us to coordinate our code changes, track our history uh, in, in terms of the code line, um, as well, we get additional features like semantic code searching, and we can manage onboard or offboard code repositories. And what I mean by that is, I can create a, a repository within Azure DevOps, or I can associate a project that I've created with an external uh, repository. Let's say a repository that sits on GitHub, or even I can associate with repositories that are uh, result um, as a result of using containers. So Docker Hub, uh, Bitbucket, um, I can, if the repository has a forward-facing URL and if it follows Git, I can attach that to our um, project. Let's take a look real quick at repos. So this particular repo is a result of the Parts Unlimited test uh, project, and it is an internal repo. So what has happened is we've created the repo within Azure DevOps, we've imported code directly, and Azure DevOps is actually managing this. In the case where I would have um, a repo managed by GitHub, what I would do is create a new repo. So in this case, if, um, well, hold on. I want to do this over here. Come up one. I could clone a repo directly, fork or create a new repo directly. So if I wanted to create a new um, repository, I might put in a repository name and then create it. And what it will do is we'll create this placeholder, which allows me to add code directly. If I wanted to import a existing repo, I could import a repo from another uh, repository. That would also be stored locally. 
when you create a project new, um, what you can do is associate that project with GitHub. So following the typical get workflow, you're gonna see commits, uh, any pushes, you're gonna see pull requests, uh, and there are no current pull requests for this particular code line, mostly because it's just a test project, but um, you're tagging. Here I can see branches. Oh, let me uh, swap to the parts unlimited one. This will be more interesting here. So if I'm flipping to branches at this point, I can see all the branches that are here. And you notice that that global shipping support uh, branch that we talked about earlier is here. We have tagging going on. And there are two pull requests. So I can drill into pull requests here. So already you can see that I can go from a agile methodology. I can apply a project template that reflects that ad, uh, agile methodology within the context of a single product, a single project within that product. I can use this as the single source of truth from work item generation and creation, management, tracking, all the way through the code line results of individuals working those work items within the project. So literally, if I go back to boards here, I can actually click into this story that presumably a developer and a couple of testers are working on. And I can literally see the code result tracking it here throughout the entire lifetime of the, the product. So what this does is it elevates Azure DevOps as essentially the single source of truth for um, a project. And actually, I just sort of kicked myself out here. So one of the things to consider is that as you're working the boards and the repos, you're going to, to want to provide an overview summary for um, your team and how it's interacting with the code, uh, the code line, the projects, the work items. And so you can set up, um, there, there is this overview and a summary that's kind of default. Um, and there's a, a wiki project right here that essentially you can update this. And what this does is it, in both the public and the private sense, what it does is it creates a um, uh, kind of a landing page for your project. Um, you can use the internal wiki and sample wiki content, or you can use a readme file. Commonly, readme files are being used, uh, especially if you have, uh, if you're using Docker Hub or GitHub, um, Bitbucket, um, you're going to get the readme uh, markdown files. Uh, that are going to be a lot more uh, uh, a lot more uh, common, and of course you can uh, select a repository. Uh, this particular repository does not have a README file configured, but you get the idea. So right here in Project Stats, uh, we see that there were 205 work items created, 24 work items are completed, there was 118 commits by nine individual authors, and there are two pull requests. 100% of the builds succeeded, and we're gonna cover that in just a minute. Currently, right now, there's only one project member, and that's me. But you can imagine that if you have a coordinated team, you're actually able now to uh, watch the entire process of your team. In addition, there are dashboards that can be customized to show exactly what's going on within the process of your team. And a lot of these dashboards support drill down to work items, which is really important. This allows us to really, uh, with a lot of speed and efficiency, navigate through the entire course of the project um, and 
be able to understand what's going on very quickly. And you can imagine also like during um, scrum meetings where you have your entire team, either it's a the business uh, a tech review or it's the actual standup. With standup, you could actually rip through all your user stories using one of the custom queries on board and then update your status fully within the team, all online using the overhead uh, projection or something like that. Um, and there you have a really fit, efficient upfront lean process. You can also take these dashboards uh, directly to your business team leaders and show uh, progress over time. So one of the things to consider also is that uh, you can customize dashboards. So this one is, this dashboard is for the overview of the entire project. What I did was I created a uh, separate dashboard that's way less interesting, but it focuses specifically on the work of one particular team. And you can see that they really haven't been doing a lot, so they're kind of lazy. Um, but hopefully you can see at this point that Azure DevOps as a, as a project management tool, as a Scrum Agile process management tool, as a code repository management tool is fully integrated. So let's take one more, let's take a look at uh, what's next here. So Azure Pipelines uh, is a cloud-based service that's plugged into Azure DevOps. And what we're looking at here is integrated and customizable build, test, and deployment of project code. And it's fully automated. So we have individual management by branch. So for instance, you can set specific rules for check-ins per branch. If you're gonna do um, alternate deployments like blue-green deployments, or uh, if you're gonna do canary deployments, all of that can be configured within Azure Pipelines. And what we're looking at with Azure Pipelines is direct continuous integration and delivery uh, in a unified pipeline structure. So let's take a look at what that looks like in uh, Azure DevOps. So I just recently ran a build on a couple of the, uh, pipelines. This is the recent build, recent view. But if you look here, you notice that there are two individual pipelines. This one's set up with uh, continuous integration. And from either of these views, I can quickly go to the latest run. So if I click on this particular run, I get a lot of information based on you know, the success of the run. Uh, there are some warnings here, some errors will show up. You can click into each warning and it shows you which component of the build stage or phase the error showed up. And you have direct interaction with all of the standard output for each one of these. So for instance, if I look at NuGet Restore, this is the .NET project, NuGet Restore was one of the build uh, processes and it was called, and you can see that we did uh, adding packages and restoring packages like restore will do. And the whole thing was successful. I get all the way down to building the solution where we're calling a .NET uh, to build, copy files. A lot of these uh, particular components of the phase were defined in the build, which um, I can uh, define the pipeline actually, which I can show you really quickly. This particular pipeline, so there's two pipelines that are active right now. There's a, a legacy pipeline, which which uses sort of, um, it uses the, the older version of Azure DevOps UI to create discrete components and it tracks all this background. Uh, and that's kind of what you're gonna see right here. This is the older version. Um, and that's fine and you can still uh, build uh, you know, pipelines this way, but what a lot of teams are doing these days is they're using um, the more integrated pipeline. And this pipeline hasn't been run yet, uh, mostly because it's it's kind of staring, it's kind of staring at a branch that has no changes right now. But in this pipeline, what we've done is we're using YAML um, and we've actually created an Azure pipelines.yaml file within the root of the project. So when I create a pipeline and I point it at a repo, 
If it doesn't already have an Azure Pipelines YAML file, it'll, it'll crank one out there. But each one of these stages, these steps, build steps, um, you can see that it triggers off the master branch. Um, here we have a build pool. There are certain variables for the pipeline. It's going to do some tasks, build, test. So here you have this highly configurable single file that defines basically the entire build pipeline. You can create very complex uh, build pipelines where you have a build, um, a test run, deployment to several different environments to include either uh, Azure functions, for example, like a serverless environment. You can build to a containerized environment. So there could be a Azure Kubernetes cluster out there that you can drop containers on. Um, you can build the individual container instance, so uh, ACIs. Um, and you can also build using all of these different build tools that are pre-built to allow you to build these uh, uh, pipelines fast. So basically, I can actually grab one of these things, customize it using a subscription, authorize, and then drop this on here. And basically that task will create this YAML and then down the road I go. And as soon as I make a change to one of these pipelines, of course, since I have continuous integration um, configured, it's gonna wanna run that pipeline. So that means that I get, that my team gets instantaneous feedback of the health of the pipeline, as well as being able to ensure that the entire pipeline is working as possible, as required. Further, pipeline, uh, uh, the new Azure pipeline supports environments for uh, individual environments where I can set up actual application pools, uh, server pools, pipeline uh, agent pools to run in uh, specific environments. So I can actually use the Azure DevOps pipeline agent, or I can, if I, if my environment is so special that I need to run uh, my own build agent with very specific requirements on an individual VM, I can configure that build agent, I can federate that build agent under an environment and run that as part of the pipeline pool. So we're supporting simple uh, team requirements where it's just a, a team of hackers and they're just trying to build some stuff using a CI CD pipeline to, to do whatever they can to shift left and maintain quality. Or it could be a more complex build where we're looking at um, highly regulated or um, large deployment requirement applications using custom build agents. That custom agent, uh, custom build agent also includes existing third party build agents that are out there. So Azure DevOps plays well with Circle CI, um, with uh, you can run Jenkins scripts, Docker scripts. There's a lot of really interesting inter integration opportunities that Microsoft has left wide open for Azure DevOps. So again, this is a single source of truth that allows you to control all aspects of your development. I can also define releases. Uh, in this case, I've defined a particular release. Um, this particular release I, I uh, had, I think has like an error associated with it, but it shows you that in each of the releases, each one of these stages has um, a, a basically a run probability. So if I click on this within the release, again, shows you right away, hey, your job succeeded, the download succeeded, the deployment did not succeed, and it's because I don't have these environments uh, configured correctly. But basically, it knew that the deployment wasn't going to work, so it skipped deploy, but overall the build had succeeded so you can see here that now i have the ability to troubleshoot all the way through my pipelines task grouping and deployment grouping um, that has to do with using uh, distributed deployment systems i won't cover that here but i want you to know that it exists as well in the library i can set variable groups um, and variable parameters uh, such as, let's say, deployment um, server name, if I wanted to use 
these variables, and these variables are accessible from that YAML pipeline script I was showing you. So that means that per environment, you could set up a set of variables that allow you to um, control your scripts a little easier. In addition, YAML files can actually reference other uh, variables and other YAML files as well. So you get uh, you can get fairly complex um, pipeline behavior. So let's shift gears a little bit to Azure test plans as we're going through this continuum. So the official Microsoft tagline is uh, for uh, Azure DevOps test plans is, is a, it's an efficient statement, but I think it kind of misses what Azure te test plans really is. So Microsoft is saying test and ship with confidence with a manual and exploring test testing toolkit. So what test plans really is though, is it's an integrated planning, configuration, and execution testing workflow that's designed to work within Azure DevOps. And what I mean by work within Azure DevOps is you've already selected your project, you've already selected your project template, Scrum, Agile, CMMI, some other custom template. Azure test plans will work within the context of those templates to ensure that we have accurate test coverage. So the nice thing is that the result for most roles on the team, if you're assuming that you have a cross-functional team, is that, again, Azure DevOps becomes the single source of truth all the way out to testing for all of your operations. So one of the questions a lot of people have when they're uh, looking at Azure DevOps, um, and specifically in test plans, uh, there's this, this concept of shifting left, which has sort of emerged over the past, uh, I don't know, couple of years in development, where what we're doing is we're ensuring ownership uh, via role and member assignment uh, uh, with work items within the Azure DevOps tool. But shift left is kind of a larger sort of concept, which basically is saying that we need to get uh, design testers and validators um, uh, involved in the software design process, software engineering process earlier. So traditionally, well, what happens is test sort of gets left to the end. Um, and I think uh, culturally people understood uh, this to be kind of the way things are done. But the problem is, is that the, lar the, the further you get down the development life cycle on a particular uh, project, and you start to find defects like further down the chain, the relative cost of fixing those defects, um, it, it grows very large very quickly. So the shift left paradigm is basically saying, look, everybody owns the quality of this code. Entire cross-functional teams can directly interact and track uh, the, the, the nature of the quality of this code if we get testers, um, UI, UX uh, specialists, user acceptance testing specialists involved way early in the process. So while a team is um, uh, collecting requirements for a particular uh, software product, or let's say we're evaluating an existing workflow for refactor, we want to have all of those testing uh, people, the, the, the people that bring the expertise and the mindset of quality assurance involved way early. So we're shifting them left to the beginning of that project timeline so that they can actually look at the requirements as they're coming in. They can apply that critical thinking test, you know, quality assurance mindset to the actual requirements as they're coming in. As the requirements are getting vetted, we're actually creating test cases um, that let's say at first are somewhat hypothetical. They basically say, well, if this is a requirement, how would I test that? So these conversations start happening earlier in the process. Um, your developers are getting um, are shifting left and getting getting uh, into the design uh, 
process uh, in terms of UI UX a lot earlier too. So what's happening is everybody's having to dialogue about what you're building earlier and more left than than uh, what has traditionally been happening over you know let's say the past couple of decades. The result is you get uh, exposure for all these uh, individual teams at the forefront. Um, using something like Azure DevOps allows you to uh, create uh, traceability at the forefront because the the natural output of all of these these cross-functional team interactions is going to be work items. So it's going to be requirements work items and uh, developer tasks that are hooked to those requirements and uh, test case work items that are hooked to those requirements. So we're tracking all of this inside the, the the scope of a DevOps project that allows roles um, over entire cross-functional teams to operate basically within the workflow and to collaborate and share earlier. Uh, feedback loops get created. Um, we can we can tie in the case of testing we can tie our test artifacts directly to requirements um, and, and the features and then we get basically first class test feedback built in early so the types of testing that azure devops can support are manual and automated testing. One of the things I'll note is most of your automated testing is going to be moved within the pipeline. Um, a lot of you who are familiar with automated testing, you know that uh, that's part, that's often part of your uh, the test portion or test stage of a pipeline. Um, it can often be a part of your pre-deployment pre um, exercise where you might run a whole battery of tests on a dedicated test server prior to deployment. So let's just say for now, uh, Azure DevOps uh, test plan supports automated testing in that it can annotate the existence of automated testing. But what, where you really get a lot of value is in the manual testing. And here I've enumerated some types of manual testing. So there's, there's planned uh, feature testing where you're basically testing each feature inside the workflow. Um, it, it can be somewhat time consuming to go through. And there is some automation that can be applied like Selenium for uh, front ends. But for the most part, the final word on testing usually is um, some sort of manual walkthrough um, sponsored by a human. And that, that would be an example of your planned feature testing. Obviously there's UI UX and uh, UAT testing. There is exploratory testing where we're uh, allocating some of our testing time for individuals to simply wander through the website, just looking for bugs or weird workflow issues. And then of course, that usually results in stakeholder feedback. So Azure DevOps uh, test plan supports all of these types of testing in addition to annotating uh, and pointing out where automated testing exists. A classic example of that gray area between full-on automated testing, um, a la the Azure DevOps pipeline, and let's say annotated uh, automated testing might be that you might have a test case that says, um, kick off a Selenium test battery against the purchase path of our e-commerce website. Uh, some of that can be automated, but at some point or another, there's usually a manual event that says, hey, you know what, it's time to test, Let's Let's kick off that Selenium battery and see what happens. When we kick that off, um, automation takes place, scripting runs Selenium against your website. Um, any expected versus actual discrepancies get logged as bugs. All of that gets dumped back into Azure DevOps as a result of the uh, test items. And you can actually see that um, within those tracked uh, items. But for the most part, if we focus on manual testing, we can see that Azure DevOps supports a test plan hierarchy that starts with a test plan. Uh, test plans contain test suites and test cases optionally. And the final result is a test run that's related to running X number of test cases and test suites. So thing to note is each one of these items as they're created within DevOps is a work item. It's just like a 
developer work item, a story, a requirement. And as such, you can you can they're uniquely identified within the context of the project. You can relate um, one or more of these to others. Uh, as well, you can trace from test run back to test case, back to test suite, back to test plan, back to the original requirements that you were testing in the first place. So what's really nice about that is you have complete end-to-end -end traceability. So for this requirement, we ran these tests. For the result of these tests, we got these test results in this test run. This helps teams be able uh, to navigate the, the current quality uh, statement of their code. Um, in addition, you can run third-party tools to uh, discover the level of code coverage uh, and the test coverage within, let's say, uh, Visual Studio and then check in those uh, artifacts into Azure DevOps and track it that way as well. So one thing to note is that test plans can contain one or more test suites. Test suites can contain one or more test suites or test cases. So you can use a certain form of test suite as a sort of ad hoc grouping system to group uh, multiple test suites and multiple test cases together at the same level. And obviously, a test run is a result of a test case or a group of test cases. So if we look at the test plan lifecycle within Azure DevOps, um, one thing to consider is it's actually really simple, and it's intended to be that way. So you're going to define a test plan, which is mostly just a, a placeholder uh, for all of the other execution items. There's a test configuration that you can apply. So you can uh, apply a global test configuration such as for the following operating systems, for the following browser variants, here's your test matrix. Use this test configuration for this particular test plan. Obviously within Azure DevOps, because you have individuals that are assigned to your team, you can, you can assign a testing team to apply to that testing plan. Once this is all set up, Basically, your testing team is going to iterate that test um, in discrete product, uh, testing runs until the product meets the testing exit criteria. So that becomes a part of that iterative process that we see in uh, Agile and Scrum. And, and then we end up with uh, the either redefining or rerunning the test plan once that product has been gone through its release cycle. So you can imagine that every release cycle, you have an opportunity to look at all of your test plans that you've set up for that uh, release cycle. You can refactor those test plans for the next release. You can leave the test plans um, if they're boilerplate uh, for regression, um, or you can create new test plans for a particular release. And Azure DevOps will track all of that history and will track all of that origin, um, which again, points back to that single source of truth across for cross-functional teams. So, there are three basic test suite types. There's a static, a requirements-based, and a query-based test suite that exists within the context of a test plan. As I said before, uh, certain types of test suite, like for instance, the static test suite can contain other test suites as well as test cases. Um, this allows you to sort of group by a feature or group in an ad hoc way. So for instance, if there was some uh, quality issue that came up as a result of a post-release hotfix, you could actually create a test suite that is focused on isolating that test fix and preventing regression. And you could set that up and say, hey, you know what, uh, we're going to run this on a regular basis every time we deploy until we're sure that that quality issue related to the hotfix um, has been mitigated and or eliminated. The other two test suites are um, interesting because they can only contain certain types of work items. So a query-based can only uh, contain test cases. Requirements can only con uh, contain test cases that are related to requirements type objects like stories um, and features. So that's something to kind of keep in mind. What Microsoft's trying to do here is, is trying to give some guidance that basically says, hey, we're gonna give you different types of test suites so that you can focus on uh, different types of activities within the QA effort. So let's take a moment and look into the unique properties of each of these test suites. So a static test suite 
is again that ad hoc really quickly built test suite that's a result of um, a query and I can actually just add individual test suites and test cases to them um, through the test explorer or I can add them directly from boards which is kind of interesting there's a there's a direct test plans uh, integration with boards that allows a, a quick management of uh, testing artifacts so here's a classic example of a, a test uh, suite example so basically I have a static test suite it actually contains um, 57 70 uh, well, actually it contains this twice which is really odd I've never done that before but these particular test suites um, have been brought are these are test suites that are defined and they've been brought into this new static suite as well there's been a new ca uh, test case that was created uh, with its unique identifier into the static suite now the static suite is of course a work item which means that it's tracked um, its history is tracked its execution is tracked and it has a unique identifier that's unique around the project so we can query it on it basically so looking at the requirements based uh, suite um, what I have here is a suite that can only contain test case uh, work item types, but is driven off of the item work item linkage with requirements type uh, stories, uh, stories and issues um, and features. So what we would do there is when we were creating a requirement because of our shift left methodology, we might have testers look at the uh, requirements that are created as they're created and then apply test cases. So we might have a requirement that says, hey, for our uh, purchase path, when we get to shipping, what we wanna do is we wanna do tax calculation for shipping on the fly inside the purchase path. So that might be a requirement. That requirement may break down into several stories and tasks, you know, we follow our agile best practices all the way down. But once we create that requirement, the business analyst requirements, analyst types can create test cases right then and there for all of the use cases of that requirement. Or they can create that requirement and as part of the Azure DevOps workflow, an alert could show up to the test team, hey, a bunch of requirements related to shipping have been uh, created, go ahead and review these and drop some test cases on them. So these are all likely scenarios that can be configured within Azure DevOps. And, and again, that sort of um, highlights the the traceability and the cross-functional capability of uh, what this project management tool brings to the table. So a requirements-based uh, example is um, basically I ran a query um, that was in a specific area path, and by default the requirements-based will default to a work item type of Microsoft.requirement category, because what it's trying to do is get you to focus on requirements. So all these product backlog items show up, which are essentially requirements for Agile. So if you're an Agile Scrum Purist, you're gonna write uh, these stories such as, as a customer, I should be able to put items in, in a shopping cart, let's say. So I'm able to ring fence um, a couple of these backlog items and then select create suites. And what it does is, inside the requirements based suite it will create these test cases and line them up it'll add these suites and line them up all of the test cases so that when i run this requirements based test suite i get only the tests that are related to the requirements that i uh, selected uh, in this example it's a little wonky because the parts unlimited uh, uh, example database is kind of it's not quite as focused on the test side as i would i would want but you can see that if you do have that quality mind, if everybody in the team is focused on uh, providing active um, test case definitions for each and every one of its requirements, you can see how this tool can become very, very useful in terms of traceability from requirement all the way down to test. So the last uh, test suite uh, uh, variant is the query-based test suite. And this one is kind of similar to the requirements based in that there's a query that drives it, but the query can be any sort of criteria. It also selects against a different uh, work item type. So in this case, the work item type is uh, Microsoft.testCaseCategory. So what we're looking for here are test cases, 
not necessarily the requirements. So the query-based uh, test suite allows me to ring fence test cases. And when I uh, say select edit query, I put in here, what I did was I, I wanted to get all the test cases within a certain area path where the priority was equal to one. So this would be a classic example of where I could very quickly create a pry one test suite um, where I might want to hit uh, all my pry one regression tests um, right after a hotfix or some sort of update. So what I'm going to do is shift over real quick to Azure DevOps here, and we'll take a look at test plans. So from the boards, um, what I did was earlier is I wanted to kind of highlight um, uh, like the idea that that um, I can associate test plans um, and test suites. So test plans are associated with uh, releases. So uh, at, at the highest level of granularity, you probably want to have um, a test plan, either the same test plan or a unique test plan per release. Um, for the test suites, those are gonna be tied to features and stories, essentially. Uh, your test cases are going to be tied to the story, um, and so you can kind of see that for the the you know the release epic uh, feature story sort of cascading hierarchy, there's an equivalent test sort of object that kind of gets tied to it. Um, the level of granularity will uh, change from team to team. It might be that the team doesn't want to mess with any of the test hierarchies, so what they do is they create a test plan per release, they slam a bunch of test cases into it. Uh, using a query-based test suite, and then that's it. They just run it, and that's perfectly okay. What Microsoft is trying to do is they're trying to make sure that um, you can customize the depth and breadth of this tool to um, uh, match the complexity of your team. So a more complex team might say, you know what, we want to have direct feature association for every one of our test suites. So for the the shipping calculation feature, there might be a shipping calculation test suite that focuses just on that. So if I go back to boards real quick, let's see here. This uh this test this work item uh, 57 is interesting because um, here you can see that. Um, it has a certain area path. Here's my description for the requirements. And right here, I have this test resource. And if I click on this, I have one um, test case that's associated with this. And so you can see that right away on boards really fast. It's very easy for us to, to get into um, what this is. So, so basically, um, if I click into this story, here we're at the requirements level um, and my description here. Typically, I would put like a done when for acceptance criteria for this. There is a task. So this might be a developer task to crank some code to make this thing happen. You'll notice that it's associated with um, this feature. So there's an epic feature story hierarchy, but it's also associated with, um, I can also associate this with a test by clicking new item here, adding test case. Sorry, it's running a bit slow. Then on doing that, Azure DevOps will create a test case. And then here, I'm able to add steps.
and then save it off. Again, what's nice about using a unified tool like this is that from any level of association, I know that I can get to the parent or the associated thing. Uh, one of the things that I also want to point out is um, I can apply tests uh, to particular code branches. So for instance, I've just done that. And now I can see pull requests and, and launch pull requests from here too. So um, there's a lot of uh, capability here. And of course, a test summary. So you can imagine, if I'm getting my team interested in shift left, if I'm if I'm wanting my requirements people, my designers, my developers, my UI, UX, my test people to merge as a cross-functional team, I'm wanting them to take a look at one tool that basically covers all of the information exchange and collaboration that's going on back and forth in my project. You can see the power here. Um, and it, it, it's, uh, it's pretty compelling when you see teams adopt, go from sort of a fractured um, tracking all this in Excel spreadsheet point of view, and there are still teams out there that are doing this, uh, to uh, using a tool like this, uh, it's pretty heartening to see. Also notice that here I can say that um, it's either not automated or planned, right? So the planned automation here is basically saying that um, this is planned, go look at your pipeline, is typically what's happening right now. I imagine that uh, Microsoft is gonna, uh, and, and that's, this brings about a good point. One of the things that's happening right now is that um, Microsoft is evolving test plans, um, it's evolving Azure De DevOps as it listens to what its customers want. It has a huge customer base on this tool and there's a lot of requirements. So, so what we're seeing is that these things are slowly evolving um, and I imagine that what's going to happen is there's going to be easier automation workflow. Here, what's happening is I can only annotate the type of, of uh, associated automation, basically saying it's this test suite, use the end unit, it's located here, it's, it's um, a uh, UI type, or I could put Selenium, here's the Selenium package, Here's the you know thing, and all it does is it basically just tracks that. So which is good because at least you're tracking that information. I mean, imagine what it's like uh, if you're trying to go up to your business team and you're and you're trying to prove to them that there's adequate test coverage, but you're not really sure. So what you have to do is walk through the halls of all of your automated testing code and try to make sense of all that. Now, uh, some of the test driven uh, development and behavior uh, driven uh, testing um, seeks to eliminate that by using an additional process that's very Scrum Agile friendly to sort of self-document their tests. Um, there's a lot of testing tools out there. I won't cover those here, but just know that those tools um, will likely integrate in the future with uh, some of the things that we're seeing here in Azure DevOps. So working back, uh, if I wanted to save these changes off, um, working back to the story, um, I also can roll up to this top level story. And here's the, the test case that I just made. At, the, at this top level feature, um, I also have a test. So this is where I was uh, mentioning that the requirements-based testing can be attached at the feature or the story level. So here, here's an additional, um, basically a, a test that is set up to, to be associated with just that feature. And when I click into it, there's, there's the steps. Um, here's the repo that I'm gonna associate with. Uh, any related work or automation, we can track that there. This is basically tested by this um, uh, feature. And so here, Another unique identifier. And again, a lot of this testing is visible right from the boards here. So you can imagine during um, a standup, we could go through and canvas each one of these 
for its uh, status. The other thing to consider is as we're uh, testing, um, there is uh, these online um, status reports, basically show testing. This is a horrible outcome <laughs> for, for trending. Um, and ideally you'd want something that kind of looks uh, more flat and then kind of goes down. But right here, what we're saying is just that most of these tests have not been run. Um, when you do roll it to, let's see if they have a better, no, they really don't, but not on this test. So basically what you'll see is uh, this is a typically a stacked chart. And so what you'll see is not run, run, and successes. And what you want to see is the not runs start to tail down, the runs start to tail up, and the successes will start to sort of come up to some sort of plateau because you only have a certain number of tests. Um, this supports, uh, Azure DevOps supports test pointing. Uh, we'll cover that here, but it's something to that you should look at because uh, test pointing is essentially like uh, agile story pointing. So we're basically uh, establishing the complexity and the coverage of the test based on test points. Uh, Azure test plan supports shared parameters and shared steps. So a classic example of shared uh, parameters is, let's assume that we have, um, I don't know, 10 or 20 test cases that all focus on some sort of user login by role. So what I've done here is I've created a test matrix basically that has different values. So I have different users, different password, different role. And what I can do is I can associate these parameter sets by going over to a test case, like this test case, for instance. And assuming that this loads, I apologize, my internet's pretty slow right now. Come on. Okay. So in uh, this test case, there are, there are two things that I can use to speed up, let's say, the creation of test cases. And what's nice about these two things, one is called shared steps, where I can share steps across uh, work items, uh, test case work items. The other one is called shared parameters. The advantage is that I can create a number of test cases, include the shared items, um, and then I'm out the door. I don't have to do consistent, uh, you know, didactic uh, data entry over and over and over again for the same thing. The caveat is, though, those shared parameters and those shared work um, or, or steps become work items in and of themselves, and they become associated in the background to each one of these test cases. So what that means is. If I have 10 test cases that use the same shared steps and I go update those shared steps, that update will reflect itself across all of those test cases. So a governance policy needs to be applied within your test team if you use this, this uh, uh, feature to ensure that when you are using shared artifacts within your test that you're not uh, inadvertently uh, clobbering yourself with changes. But to kind of focus back on the test parameters, in the parameters values, um, I can add parameters basically by using the at symbol prior to um, something. So let's say if I have a test step that says enter at username and log in, basically I could put those parameters here. But let's assume. Uh, that this is the typical uh, user login scenario. And so I've got username and password. What I can do is either do the state entry, convert them to shared uh, parameters right away, or I can just add a parameter set. And when I add the parameter set, I can go ahead and just use this one. And what happens is this gets added. Now the thing is, is that username and password is the mapping and you can see that it auto mapped. But if I was using something like, um, a local parameter, let's say, then I would have to go up and map this 
to the shared parameter set. So that means that you could take, um, you know, uh, an existing team test requirement and map it. Now, typically, if you're using a proper governance within the team, if your developers and your requirements people and your testers are all talking about tests, about quality assurance being one of the most important things you could deliver aside from the product, um, then a lot of the stuff will go away because you'll use a strong convention that is more like this in order to prevent um, errors, you know, uh, misunderstandings, confusion, et cetera, et cetera. But note that if if I use this shared parameter set and I change this this login, that's going to reflect to every um, test case that uses the shared parameters. So kind of resetting. Uh, the other thing I can do really quickly is um, I can use the same test case here. And I can say, you know what? I'm tired of typing this. Um, I do this all the time for all these test cases. I can just create shared steps. And I can, And typically what will happen is teams will want to um, use a uh, some sort of naming convention that calls out uh, – you know, um, something like this. You, you can use smart naming to make sure that people don't get confused. Now, what's interesting is what I've just done is I've created uh, shared steps. So it becomes a work item, gets tracked in TFS, everything that, or excuse me, in uh, Azure DevOps. Everything that happens to that uh, gets logged um, and we can track it, but I can click on this and it will literally jump me to this um, shared steps and inside the shared steps I can put parameter values. One caveat here is I cannot use shared parameters inside shared steps but what I can do is I can create parameter values here okay and they in effect become shared once I share the steps and once again there's that caveat if I make a change and I save it off then every single test case that uses this will have that change applied. So you have to be careful. All right. So moving on, I'll move really quickly to Azure Artifacts. So uh, Azure Artifacts is interesting because um, it's relatively new in, in, in sort of the Azure DevOps realm, but what we're basically doing here is we're creating a component um, repository or depot um, similar to NPM or NuGet um, Maven that allows us to take our build artifacts, um, components, uh, whole applications, put them into Azure Artifacts and create a global secure distribution point. Now that distribution point can be public or it could be private. So for instance, if I'm using a public distribution point, I might have a public GitHub that's, that's some open source thing with a lot of um, uh, individual contributors, and I can basically dump the results of that um, output to Azure Artifacts and say, hey, when you guys are using composition within the software design that we've all agreed on, go ahead and grab the components from this uh, artifact repo instead of going and getting it yourself. There's a lot of reasons why we want to do that. Uh, a governance, version governance, um, uh, uh, let's say quality governance, licensing governance. There's a lot of reasons why we want to do that. The other thing we can do is we can set up feeds for particular uh, users. So for instance, um, if we're using a, a, a slow rollout deployment, a canary deployment, uh, some of your more, um, your, your uh, limited alpha and beta test uh, deployments, you can set up artifacts to just deploy uh, or allow um, deployment to specific groups of people. So for instance, if we were doing a canary build where we're just using our internal teams to sort of eat our own dog food and, and double check that this thing works before we release to live, we might set up an Azure artifacts thing. We might say, go grab your application from here using you know Python, Maven, um, .NET, uh, NuGet, 
uh, NPM. It supports all of these providers, and I'll show you that in a minute. But what we basically want to do is we want to control that release. That is a great scenario for Azure Artifacts. So going to take a look here. So zooming the lens in a little bit, you have package management, and it's integrated directly into Azure DevOps. So your pipeline can literally drop directly to Azure Artifacts. Um, we're looking at the creation and management and sharing of common packages via the concept of feeds. Your feeds can be both public and private, as I said, for organizations or for teams of any size. Now, I don't have um, a full feed set configured on this particular example, but I'll just show you a screenshot that came from uh, one of the Microsoft um, uh, Azure DevOps team blog. Oops, sorry. So you can see here that basically in the Azure Artifacts um, uh, setup, um, this member has created multiple feeds, okay? And each feed has a different provider. So here I've got a NuGet provider, I've got a Python provider, I've got a Maven provider, um, I've got a universal, um, I forget which one this is, a provider, but here, uh, here's a, a NPM provider for Node. So you can see that I could actually have a lot of different types of providers interacting on the same feed and interacting with a lot of different components. And this allows me to sort of uh, do a number of things. One, I can track downloads, okay? I can get a description out. So each one of these uh, descriptions can be a link to the, the actual page, um, uh, uh, some page content that basically shows what this is. I could actually hot link out to existing Git repositories. Um, I could also say that, hey, I actually don't build uh, this and this component, but I want you to use these two versions of the component when you're using my other thing. And that means that you can say to people, hey, go to this feed. Everything you need is in this feed. Go to it and I'll track it. Um, you also have tracking on users, so you can double click and see users, especially, that's especially helpful when you're doing uh, Canary deployments. So shifting uh, screens here, we jump over to artifacts. For this particular uh, demo, like I said, I didn't go out and build um, feeds, um, but I have some, there are some uh, things here. One is a, a project level uh, feed. So this is basically just deals with this project. And the other one is an organizational uh, level feed. So I have, basically two feeds that are set up at the organizational level. So I just did that to, to um, sort of illustrate that we can have feeds at different scopes. So for instance, if I have multiple projects that have multiple outputs in terms of artifact that are all within the same organization, I can get all those projects to deploy to one feed that covers the entire organization. Or I can set it up so that the feed is just scoped to an individual product, uh, project rather. Um, the other thing is, like, when you're creating a feed, uh, Azure Artifacts, uh, Azure DevOps Artifacts is basically asking you for the level of uh, visibility. So um, I can basically set up distribution groups through basically um, inviting people. So if it was just me and a couple of hackers and I wanted them to use this feed, then we would do something like this. Um, any uh, members, either tenant members or external tenant members that have been added to Azure DevOps Central, so I can I can go organization wide, or I can go as far as going all the way out to my Active Directory tenant. Upstream sources, of course, I can aggregate uh, from existing upstream sources, and then here's where we're setting the scope. So basically, if I run this up, let's see here. It will go ahead and create this feed at the project level. But what's interesting is that if I say connect to feed, the first thing it's going to ask me is um, which provider do I want to use? And if I select, let's say I want to use uh, NPM, let's say. 
uh, there's information here because uh, it knows that this MPM provider is not loaded um, local to this organization. So here I'll basically say, hey, this is the first time I'm using NPM on this machine, get the tools, and it actually tells you, here's what you need to do to install all of this stuff locally to a machine or within the context of Azure DevOps. So also um, you can use integration directly with uh, personal access tokens um, where you're actually using a personal access token that is related to your uh, login credentials on Azure DevOps. You can use that token and give that to somebody. So for instance, if I wanted to interact directly with uh, GitHub, for instance, I can go out to this project. Um, uh, the, the, the project configuration and the, I can create a service uh, connection. Let's say I want to use um, GitHub. What I do is I'd set up OAuth directly to Azure Pipelines, service connection name and a description using the personal access token, which I would paste here. Okay. And the interesting thing about personal access tokens is that it uh, will create only the personal access token once. So you have to basically cut and paste it right there at that moment. And then you can basically cut and paste it in here. If I'm using authorization, it's a little different. Here I'm using Azure Pipelines as the authorization. If I click authorize, what it's gonna do is it's gonna go out and try to use my uh, credentials to create um, essentially a service principle within the context of my Azure directory tenant. And what'll happen is, I will be using that service principle every time um, Azure DevOps and GitHub interact. So that means that I can set up really complex service connection relationships between, let's say, my DevOps pipelines and a Azure Kubernetes um, uh, cluster, or maybe uh, I want the, my pipeline to run Docker script where I go out and grab the latest Ubuntu 1804 LTS for my build, um, uh, maybe I have um, to set up some custom uh, test configuration where I'm using a test agent that requires uh, some sort of containerized build or some sort of um, automated interaction prior to testing. I can do all of that using service connections. One of the other things to note is that on the pipeline setup, I can actually create, and this one has a bunch of um, sort of default pipelines we've been messing around with, but Azure Pipelines will set up uh, its own default pipeline where it actually sets up an agent in the cloud, um, and then that's a, up here, to run. Uh, this actual pipeline here that's set as default is actually running on a VM that we set up. And then also we can host on particular machines uh, in the cloud as well. So that means that I can actually set up X number of agent pools that reflect um, uh, basically the build environment that I that I require the build and test environment. I can even set up a um, individual, let's say, custom built agent that sits out on a VM or in a private data center, as long as it has you know basically um, as long as this firewall is open and I can connect to it and I can set an agent on it. That, that actually will run um, a complex uh, build environment for me. And Azure DevOps can drive all of that through the pipeline. Looking at some of the other project settings, here's how you can set administrators. I can turn off certain features. I can delete projects. Here's where I define my teams. And you can see I have a number of teams uh, set up here. Uh, currently, there's only one member of this particular team because I'm the only one sort of allocated to this test. Um, in permissions, basically, we're setting up groups and users, and we're applying uh, roles to those groups and users, so we're using our back all the way through. Notifications. These are all your request notifications for pipeline. Um, I have it set so that when I'm running um, most of these, that it will basically announce uh, to a certain group and that group gets email. 
on events. Service hooks. Here we can create individual service hooks. I'm not going to go into this because it's actually there's a lot you can do here, um, and I don't want to confuse. But definitely know that that there are integration, there are hard integration points that are applied, that are created uh, uh, underneath Azure DevOps to to allow uh, teams to get into more complex integration scenarios. And obviously the ability to um, use dashboards. Now, one of the things is, is you might actually have somebody with uh, elevated permissions, but you may not want them to mess around with any of the dashboards. So what you can do is you can create the dashboards and then um, remove, edit and delete capability from almost everybody except for the this select admins. Um, it's actually kind of nice so that people don't inadvertently uh, move dashboards. Here's where we can set up uh, basically the project and then we can set up individual sprints. So for instance, I can add an individual sprint that might have a um, arbitrary start and end date, set an iteration name, and there we go. So this becomes an iteration inside a sprint, which is kind of not ideal, but this is where you'd set that. Uh, team configuration, backlog levels. Some people don't like to use epics, so they'll deselect epics um, and features in some cases, some more extreme cases. And what they end up with is just the flat black uh, backlog of uh, backlog items. Um, and I've seen, I've seen that, like, for instance, um, I've seen scenarios where project management is using a project that closely maps to an existing project. And rather than change the queries, what they do is they deselect actual backlog items so that they're just focused on the top level. And then they report on that. It's kind of a crunchy way to do it, but, uh, because I'd much rather have them, um, manage through queries and then leave all these options. Um, and GitHub, GitHub connections. Uh, Microsoft owns GitHub now. Um, some people know that, some people don't. So basically you can uh, do a first class uh, connection to GitHub either using personal access token or GitHub enterprise server if you happen to own that. And what that'll do is create direct integration with Azure boards. So all of your GitHub comments and events, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, get mapped directly to the Azure board. Um, and so that's that's a lot of what's going on uh, here with, you know, obviously you can control custom retention on test. The default I think is 30, yeah, 3365. Okay, so at this point, um, what I'd like to do is turn over um, our conversation here to questions, if there are any, and we can send those through. Um, uh, the the chat here. So if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, what we're doing is we're we're uh, recording this video, and what we all will do is we'll make sure that it's available for you to take a look a little later. One uh, other thing I'd like to point out is um, the Azure DevOps is constantly under development. Um, Microsoft has been very responsible and very careful about what they roll out in terms of new workflow and stuff like that. A lot of it can be controlled on the preview feature set here. Um, for instance, uh, you'll notice right here, there's a there's a analytics views and an asterisk. Well, this is a new preview that they've been rolling out um, and they will, typically tell you ahead of time that this is enabled or disabled. So if I disable this, basically what will happen is this will disappear. And so there's, you can see kind of what's what's happening, what, what they're rolling out here. Um, also, looking at the Azure DevOps blog and the website um, that Microsoft has um, can really help uh, give your company some insight as to where they're going uh, in terms of the new features that they're adding. Again, I think they've been 
very, very responsible because they, they know that teams are using this as sort of the, the um, digital nervous system for all of, uh, you know, their, their team's efforts from, you know, start to finish. So they're, they're being very careful. Um, but some of the new things to, to notice is uh, this new wiki experience is going to be huge because they're actually going to use, I think, the wiki syntax rather than the weird wiki thing that they're using right now. So I hope that we've been able to give you a good overview of um, Azure DevOps. Uh, and I hope that you'll be able to take a deeper look if you're not using it. Um, and, and if you are using it, then um, at skillmeup.com, we have deeper um, courses that are on structured online courses. We have two day, three day, and a deep dive, uh, um, like a um, sort of a um, software engineering product deep dive um, that you may be interested in that can advance uh, your team's knowledge of you know, best practices in this area. So I'm going to leave the the latter few moments here to questions that and please uh, let me know if you have any. Okay, yes, we have a direct question here. So is there a way to integrate Azure DevOps with IntelliJ IDE for developers, just like Visual Studio? And the answer to that is yes. Um, I'm going to try to really quickly find. I think it's tricky because um, TFS used to be kind of the on-prem uh, installation of um, Azure DevOps. And TFS basically, okay, so there's these two resources. Um, this one's actually interesting, the DevOps lab labs one, because um, I ran across this a while ago. But this right here um, has, the level of integration, I think, is still, and, and we need to be careful because um, some of these don't get updated for a while, but the level of integration, at least um, for Azure DevOps, um, has been focused on the code repo. So, for instance, um, using IntelliJ, so we were creating a, a repo here, and then it's basically through GitHub and Team Services Git is where you get most of your integration. So you're, you're going to actually be able to control version control at this point. The um, the team services thing right here, I think that does facilitate uh, stories now. So a little bit more investigation um, will likely be required. But what you're getting essentially is uh, project management through the code line. Oh, yeah, here we go. Here's your story integration right here. So, um, yeah. So the requirement is that you're connected to um, the latest version of Azure DevOps. Um, you can create uh, pull requests through the GET. And it also works with Eclipse as well. And of course, Xcode. Um, your strongest sort of integration is going to be with Visual Studio and VS Code, however. And VS Code sort of taken over, like in a lot of development teams have kind of switched from IntelliJ and from actual Visual Studio even and Eclipse to moving towards Visual Studio Code simply because it's lightweight um, and it seems to not explode um, like some of these others do. But uh, the other thing is, let's see here. Yeah, I, I ran across this earlier, and it might even be this one. Um, not this one. Um, ah, yeah, here we go. JetBrains themselves, actually, they have a lot of information based on this. Cool. So other questions? Here, I'm going to go ahead and drop this link in here. You, you probably have already seen this, but just in case. probably share the screen here yeah I did okay good okay so the other thing um, to consider is uh, taking a look at um, skillmeup.com uh, this is the company I represent and we offer hands-on learning for a lot of uh, these topics Microsoft Azure and 365 
um, you should check it out. There's some pretty pretty awesome stuff that we have available. So for instance, if um, containers, for instance, if you just search by the things you're interested in, um, we can show you individual lectures. And there's different kinds of um, levels here for interaction, but feel free to check that out. And always up here at the upper left is the online training that's coming up. Cool. Well, at that, I'm going to um, leave you guys to your day, and I hope you guys have a very safe and wonderful week. And thank you very much for attending our, uh, our uh, presentation here. Have a good day.